Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. I am a board certified rheumatologist with over 15 years of experience treating patients with all kinds of rheumatic and inflammatory conditions. Here on this channel, I like to bring you the information you need about rheumatology and immunology so you can make the best health decisions for you. Today is an exciting topic. At least I find it exciting. We are going to explore the question, can we prevent lupus? So stick around. So before we get started, let me just cut to the chase because I know this is YouTube and people want to get in and out. Can we prevent lupus? Well, no, not yet. My purpose today though is to do a little digging. What will need to happen to get us to a place where we can predict lupus and how close are we? If you aren't into the history and context, then you can check out the chapters of this video and skip to the part you want to hear. Before we attempt to answer the big question of can we prevent lupus, I think it's important that we take a step back and remind ourselves what it means to prevent anything. Well, we all know that to prevent simply means to keep from happening. But in medicine, how do we do this? What is the information we need to know to start? I'm going to use the example of smoking and lung cancer as I think this is something we are all familiar with. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is identify the problem. Well, in our example, the problem is that people get lung cancer, that leads them to get super sick and then they can die. Next, we need to have ways to consistently diagnose the problem. How do we know when someone has lung cancer? We start with what we see with our eyeballs, which are the symptoms. Someone can have a cough that doesn't go away, someone can have trouble breathing, or they can start losing weight without trying. We then work backwards from that. Okay, so in those people with those symptoms, what tests can we do to diagnose the problem? How easy and reliable are those tests? How early can we catch the problem using those tests? In our example, we found that chest x-rays and CT scans can show us the problem and we have developed a whole slew of criteria and algorithms based on the tumor size, the spread, and other data points that can tell us how severe someone's problem, in this case the lung cancer, may be. Now that we know how to diagnose the problem reliably, we need to figure out who needs to be screened for this problem. Everyone? That would require a test that is 100% specific, which a chest x-ray is not. If we did a chest x-ray on everyone, we'd most definitely find stuff that is not lung cancer. So then, well, who? Who is at risk for lung cancer? Well, while research was being done on testing and treatments, there is also research into what common threads are shared by people with lung cancer. Answering that question, is there anything everyone with lung cancer has in common? And turns out there was, smoking. So more research and a lot of math is done by statisticians and it's determined that those at risk people for lung cancer are people from 50 to 80 years old, who have a 20 pack year history and are either currently still smoking or have smoked in the past 15 years. Meanwhile, other scientists and statisticians are figuring out which test is best and boom, we get official recommendations. We know who to test and we know how to test them. But what about preventing lung cancer? And that's the final step. We need to identify the intervention for prevention. When smoking was identified as the common thread, it also provided the path towards prevention. Thankfully, smoking is not a gene or some sort of non-changeable biologic fact. It's a behavior. So prevention in this example was simply, she says as if it's simple, getting people to stop smoking and moving them from the at-risk population to the low-risk population. So again, the steps are, Identify the problem, identify and understand the ways in which to diagnose the problem, identify those that are at risk for the problem, and then identify the intervention for preventing the problem. Easy. Okay, back to lupus. So how do we do this with lupus and is it even possible? 
So lupus is an autoimmune systemic condition that can affect different organs to varying degrees. People can have severe lupus with kidney, brain, or even heart issues. Others can have a more mild, although still life-changing version that is mainly joint pain, fatigue, and rashes. And then of course there's everything in between. We diagnose lupus based on a set of criteria that have been around forever and always hotly debated amongst experts that include lab tests and certain symptoms. If you have enough of the criteria, you are said to have lupus. It takes too many people way too long to get diagnosed for a number of reasons. And there has been growing interest in figuring out how to make that diagnosis earlier. And I don't just mean getting patients into a rheumatologist office faster. I mean catching the disease earlier. Do we really need X number of criteria to be met in order to make a diagnosis? And this is what got me so excited. There is work being done to completely reframe the way we think about how we diagnose lupus. This could help us identify people earlier and possibly provide an intervention that could prevent further lupus activity. So what do I mean by this? Well, let me paint a picture. A young woman has been having fatigue, the occasional joint stiffness, and has noticed a rash when she's out in the sun. She sees her doctor and an ANA test is ordered and comes back one to 160. She is told she may have lupus and she is referred to a rheumatologist. She has a three month wait to get into that rheumatologist and in those three months, she's scouring the internet for information and likely losing sleep. She comes to her rheumatologist prepared after months of research and tells her about her fatigue, her hand pain and her sun rash. Unfortunately, because this is the way it always happens, her hand pain hasn't really happened for weeks and she doesn't have the rash at the time of the appointment. She has a picture, but the doc says they don't really see anything. So she gets told she has nothing, that the ANA doesn't mean anything and good luck. Or maybe there's more testing that's ordered, but all of that then comes back negative and then she's told she has nothing. She wants to be relieved. She is kind of relieved except she still feels like crap. She goes back to her primary care doctor and this gets played out over and over again until six, nine, or 12 months later, she lands in another rheumatologist's office and this time she's got the rash and the doctor says she feels some swelling in her joints. Done. Diagnosis made. Positive blood tests, positive symptoms. But did it really need to take that long? What if? In that first visit, instead of being told that she has nothing, or at best, she may have something, but it's not full blown yet, she was told she has stage two lupus. Or better yet, what if two years prior to any of this happening, her primary care doctor identifies her as someone who is at risk, maybe because she has a strong family history, and she then did an ANA test that was found to be positive that then led to a diagnosis of stage one lupus. And what if she was then offered something that could prevent her from going from either stage one or two to full blown lupus? Wouldn't that be something? I, I thought so. So are we there yet? Well, no. Like I said from the get go, we aren't, but it's coming. And that's why I got so friggin' excited. Research is being done looking at how to identify the at risk people and then providing them with an intervention that could prevent full-blown lupus. So how far along are we? Well, let's go back to the framework I used to describe the lung cancer example. So number one, identify the problem. Lupus, I think we've got number one down. Number two, we need to figure out ways to reliably diagnose the problem. We are pretty decent at diagnosing full-blown lupus and getting better at identifying early lupus. We've known for years that the changes to the immune system that happen with lupus and really any other autoimmune condition can happen years before they actually get to the point where there are diagnosable, at least with our current methods of diagnosing. But what's exciting is we are now getting much better at testing for those autoimmune changes that happen in our blood before we develop frank symptoms. To be fair, a lot of the fancy testing that I'm talking about is done in research labs, not in the clinics, yet. Next, we need to identify those at risk. 
Similar to our understanding of the immune system changes that happen before symptoms actually start, we are getting more refined in our thinking about genetics, family history, and hormonal, viral, and UV light exposure that would put someone in an at-risk category. And then finally, we need to identify the intervention, the intervention for prevention. It is still very early stages, but there's already research being done on the effects of different interventions. So although we aren't there yet, this framework excites me that it's coming. But a word of warning, as I've said throughout this video, there is hope and reason to be excited about this, but we aren't there yet. If you go to your doc and say, but Dr. Ortiz said I could have stage one lupus and you need to give me something to prevent full-blown lupus, they will likely give you side eye and say, who knows what about me in the back room. We are not at the point yet where any doc, including me, can confidently recommend any prescription medication just because you have a positive ANA and maybe have a concerning symptom or two. We are still using our criteria to make a diagnosis, as flawed as they may be. So you may be thinking, this is great, but is there really nothing I can do right now? Well, no, I would never say that. Are we at the point where a medication should be recommended? No, not really. Are we at a point where I can confidently recommend certain diet or supplements to prevent lupus? No. But even before I was introduced to this new framework and research being done, I have always seen the presence of an autoantibody such as ANA when accompanied by certain symptoms as an invitation to look at how you are living your life and see if there's any room for some healthier habits. Does your diet consist of a lot of restaurant or fast food? Instead of getting all wound up in any specific diet, why not just bring down your eating out and cook more at home? Are you consistently getting to sleep late or having a hard time falling asleep? Why not work on some healthy sleep hygiene to get your sleep more regular? Are you behind a computer most of the day and barely make it to the gym? Hey. Why not focus on getting up and walking around more during the day? Although it is true that an ANA result is not always clear, if you have had a positive result and you have persistent symptoms like brain fog, fatigue, joint pain, or rashes, it could be a sign of immune system dysregulation. And although I cannot guarantee that eating less Taco Bell or sleeping eight hours a night will prevent lupus, it can't hurt. Okay, now my favorite part. I love giving y'all nuggets to chew on, questions to ponder and take with you to your next visit so that you can continue this conversation. So number one, have you been told you have a positive ANA but nothing else? Are there elements of your lifestyle that could stand a refresh? I know it's frustrating as hell to not get solid answers, I do which is why I wanted to talk about this topic because it really could change the way we think about so many in this situation. I would encourage you though, to look at your lifestyle and see where some changes could be made. Adding more veggies, taking a lunch walk or getting to bed earlier are all small but really amazing things you can do for your health. And guess what? I would be telling you to do those things if you were diagnosed with lupus anyways. So why not get a head start? Number two. If you find yourself having that there's nothing wrong with you conversation with your rheumatologist, I'd recommend asking, would it be possible to get myself on your calendar in another six months? I understand this might not turn out to be anything, but given the on again, off again symptoms I've been having, I would like to come back in six months to see if anything changes. All they can say is no. And honestly, if they say no, then get yourself another doctor. Okay, I hope you are excited as I am, but I love seeing lupus researchers taking our real world experience with patients and using it to build a completely different paradigm in how we should think about lupus. I hope this helped and thanks so much for staying through to the end. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe and share with anyone you think would be as jazzed about this as me. Thanks and see you next time.